So today I'm going to be talking to you about one application of swarm intelligence, which is a class of algorithms that is inspired by some of the ways that nature solves its problems. So I'm going to start by introducing the concept of emergent complexity, which is a theory that describes how some complex systems arise. And then I'm going to explain that as being some of the intuition behind swarm intelligence and how it works. We'll discuss some of the principles of swarm intelligence. And then I'll show how we can apply those principles to develop a really interesting and accurate way of the way that, uh, accurate model of the way that birds flock in large groups. Then we're going to consider how we can apply this model to solve a real world problem in computer science, um, particularly numerical optimization. Um, the algorithm that we develop um, in order to solve numerical optimization as a problem is called particle swarm optimization. And we'll develop it by showing that we can just change very, very subtly the way the birds move to allow them to move through the search space and find a uh, solution to the problem for us. Then I'll talk a little bit about what we've learned. Okay, um, so I've put a definition of emergent complexity up there only because that's the one that's used in literature. Don't actually like it. Um, a phenomenon whereby larger entities arise through interactions among smaller or simpler entities. Essentially, emergent complexity requir requires two things. Fundamental units in a system that have some simple behavior that we understand, and an external force that drives those, drives those things to cooperate in some way, um, where cooperate is quite a loose term. We're talking about not necessarily things that have any sentience or understanding. It can just be objects that are, are moving in some way to minimize energy, say. And what we get from this is some complex behavior. Okay, so very abstract. I'm gonna explain in terms of a few examples. Firstly here, we have a physical example, um, courtesy of Malavika here. Um, hexagonal bonding of ice. Um, ice bonds into hexagonal, hexagonal crystal structures, um, and so the fundamental unit we have here is H2O molecules. Um, and there are obviously various processes that describe how this thing grows, but the one we're interested in here is something called dendritic growth. Um, which allows the ice crystals to move along preferential axes in the crystal. Uh, so they grow along preferential crystal axes, develop these really complex and interesting structures that we call snowflakes. Um, and there are many different types of snowflakes, um, although not an infinite set. Um, there we go. Okay, so here's an example from nature. Um, we have army ants, which are groups that cooperate in really, really interesting ways. Just one example is an ant bridge um, which is they can link together to allow them to get food from areas. Um, we're going to talk about why we care about natural selection in particular, um, because this is really interesting for getting our, it's really interesting because it generates algorithms that are really good for computer science in a way that I'll talk about later. Another example, um, <laughs> we can even argue that life itself is just a series of emergent complexities um, layered on top of each other. Um, so amino acids, forming, forming proteins, forming tissues, forming organs, whatever, as far, as far up as you want to go. Um, if you want to get particularly philosophical, and I'm not going to, um, you can argue that the amino acids are just, you can, you can layer this down as well until you get to the fundamental laws of physics, uh, but since Marius is here, I'm not gonna do that. Um, okay, so we've talked about emergence, but it's, there's nothing fundamentally natural about it. We can develop systems artificially that exhibit this complex behavior. So, really classic example is Conway's Game of Life. Um, we divide space into a discrete a finite number of cells, or infinite number of cells, doesn't really matter. Um, and we can derive really complex behavior just with some simple rules that defi define evolution over time. Um, in fact, we can, this system is as expressive as any other system we could possibly come up with because it's very complete. Um, this sparked an entire field um, and again, I'm not getting philosophical about this, but there are, uh, it, there are interpretations of quantum mechanics um, that are explained in terms of cellular automata. So you could argue that all of the other emergence things I've been talking about so far are just emergences from Conway's Game of Life or something very similar. Let's not get into that. So, we've shown that we can achieve complexity. It's fair to ask at this point, why do we care? Um, complex systems are not necessarily useful. Um, but there's something really interesting about the way complexity arises in natural systems. Um, complexity in nature is really expensive from an evolutionary level. Um, 
So it's quite hard, this is quite hard to get across, but I think it's quite intuitive. Um, if you have a complex system in nature and a simple system in nature that are both solving the same problem with the same effectiveness, the simple one will win, purely because it uses less energy to achieve that. Um, natural selection will dictate that the simpler one wins. So if we look into nature and we see complicated systems, um, we can reason just priori, a priori, that there is no, that there must be some reason that the, that complexity exists. There is a good reason that this algorithm is efficient. So at this point, I'm gonna define swarm intelligence to be the useful subset of emergent com systems that exhibit emergent complexity. And we've discussed why natural systems in particular are good candidates for this, um, because they must solve some sort of problem. But there's a few other reasons why as well. Um, problems in computer science sometimes line up incredibly well with things that we have to solve in real life. Um, so pathfinding is one of them. Um, if you consider, you can argue that trying to find food in some unknown, in some unknown field um, is the same as trying to find the minimum value of a function in some unknown search space. Um, this is a very similar problem. Um, and lastly, nature has inherently high distributivity, um, which is to say that if you have a series of uh, organisms moving together, um, that is inherently order one local complexity. Um, ants in large groups don't become more intelligent as we increase the size of the group. Each ant only has some finite capacity to think about its surroundings. And so any algorithm that ants must come up with to solve their problems is something that we could use in a distributed system to achieve each node only having order one complexity. Okay, before I get too, too far away from uh, reality here, there are a lot of fair criticisms about swarm intelligence. Um, there was a period of time around 2005 and 2006 where any idiot could get a paper published about swarm intelligence just by saying, look at my algorithm, it, it's like waterfalls and it solves a problem. Um, but there are, not all, problem, not all problems can be solved by something in nature and not all things in nature can map, can map onto uh, neat problems in computer science. Okay, we're gonna talk about birds flocking. There are all these other ones that are just a bit crap. Okay, birds flocking. Um, this is a murmuration of starlings. Um, they're really cool. I'm gonna show you a video. Um, this is thousands of starlings moving through space. They're solving an optimization problem, which is they're trying to minimize their energy use in traveling through, through space. And it's quite a hard optimization problem even. Um, there's, there's dynamic flow of air going on. Um, the starlings themselves are quite stupid. Um, and so they're trying to solve a problem uh, with limited resources. And we're gonna talk about how we can achieve something like this with a simple computer system. So, we want to accurately simulate this behavior. Um, we want the complexity to be emergent. That is to say, we don't want to have a really complicated system because we're trying to show we can achieve this if we were a stupid starling, say. And we also want order one local behavior because as I've said before, that is the constraint that nature puts on us. Okay, we're gonna have a really simple model each bird is just defined by its position and its velocity. And each bird has some total awareness of everything that's happening around it in some sphere. Um, it can see everything that's happening um, in that sphere, but can see absolutely nothing outside that sphere. Um, I might call these boids at some point. Uh, that's the word in the literature. I don't like it. Uh, it stands for bird-like object. Sure, whatever. Um, so the way our simulation is going to work is um, at each point we will take, uh, we will evolve a time step where each, each, part, uh, each bird moves by, some, uh, moves by some amount corresponding to its velocity vector. Um, then it looks around in the vicinity around it by this, in this sphere that we've defined and it considers changing its velocity vector by some amount. Then we carry on evolving time steps and we have a simulation. Um, each bird is going to change its velocity according to behaviors that we define. So we're going to say, um, we, want the, we want the birds to behave in this way, and in this way, and in this way. And then the total change in velocity will be the sum of each of these influences. So now I'm gonna to describe to you how we want, just reason vaguely about how we want our system to behave, and then we'll try to derive some behaviors. The first one is really obvious. Birds in real life can't fly through each other, um, nor do they very often hit each other because that's expensive. 
um, from an evolutionary point of view. Um, so uh, each bird will try to fly away from uh, any birds that are very close to it within its own sphere. This is kind of a smaller sphere that, it's, that it cares about. Um, really simple. Next one, alignment. If we look closely at a flock of birds and zoom in to, a, to an individual bird's perspective, you can see that those birds tend to agree about the direction that the flock is moving in at that local level. It's only when you zoom out that you see that there's some complex, complex behavior going on where the birds are all moving in kind of a, a very different but subtly different direction. Um, so what, what we're going to model this as is a bird cares about moving in the average direction of the birds in its vicinity to some extent. And lastly, cohesion. Um, the flock moves together as a group. Um, any in real life, any stragglers in a group suffer massive, massively more drag as they move through, move through space. And so the birds have some incentive to keep together. Um, and we're going to just model this as a bird has some extent to which it wants to move towards the center of gravity of the, uh, of the flock, of the birds that it sees in its vicinity, which is not necessarily the center of gravity of the flock. OK. Um, I have a practical demonstration, uh, which is not mine, so I'm not going to uh, stick on it for very long. Uh, this belongs to someone called Daniel Schiffman. Um, here we have two-dimensional birds, unfortunately. Um, the three-dimensional example is much cooler. Um, moving through space, and we can tweak some parameters, which you can't see, unfortunately. Um, so someone, someone actually said to me earlier on that these look like ants, uh, which I think is really interesting, um, because ants, ants' behavior through space is quite similar to, flo uh, to flocks of birds, except in two dimensions. Um, so you can see that we've achieved kind of clusters, cl small clusters of birds. Um, if we were to raise up our sphere of influence, um, you can kind of argue that uh, we would achieve only a single cluster. But what I'm trying to show you here is that uh, depending on the vicinity, um, how, how great the radius is of that sphere, um, we can have smaller or greater clusters. I'm going to see if I can take away, uh, so that's taking away the alignment behavior. Um, and now you can see individual flocks are no longer agreeing. They're just colliding with each other. That's probably quite hard to see, but I can't increase the size of the birds, unfortunately. Um, if we take away separation, um, the birds just fly through each other all the time. Um, we'll talk later about why we care about separation in particular. But anyway, let's get back to the talk. Um, get rid of this. OK. So we have seen that we can reasonably accurately simulate birds. You'll have to take my word for it. If you do that in 3D, it looks very similar to the way the starlings were flying. OK. Now we're going to try and sol use this to solve an optimization problem. Um, the classical solution to this is to take approximations to the, the way the function is evolving um, within a local vicinity and move in the, re the direction that uh, corresponds to the way you want to move. Um, that's gradient descent. The other solution that is kind of canonical form of a class of, a class of uh, algorithms that solve this problem is simulated annealing. Uh, this is a more stochastic method um, that tries to randomly progress, randomly converge on the true solution. Um, both of these problems suffer from local, suffer from local minima um, in that they, they will return local minima as if they were global minima. Um, and so they have pathological cases that we can construct. And uh, since the algorithm that we are deriving is a more kind of random inspired process, inspired from nature, we're expecting to avoid some of those pathological cases. Um, so particle swarm optimization. This is a really simple idea. We're going to take our flock of birds, and we're going to move them into our search space for the function. Then we're going to give them some new behavior that corresponds to them wanting to move in the direction that minimizes the function. So our new behavior is going to be called convergence. And I'll define it more, more properly later. Um, but we're also going to leave in place the other three behaviors that we have. Um, you can reason a little bit about why it makes why those behaviors still make sense um, in a search-based optimization problem. Um, interestingly, the reason that this is called a swarm optimization is because the original paper that submitted this thing um, didn't have alignment or uh, separation as behaviors. Um, and so if you take these away, the, the birds, or particles in this case, tend to uh, 
what you saw. They tend to behave more like a swarm, more like bees than birds. Um, so that's just an interesting term. Um, so the mathematical form that describes our cohesion behavior. Um, there's a little bit of magic here. Um, we, we have random numbers that just help us uh, avoid pathological cases. Um, so we're going to have vectors of length n, uh, of length n, yes, uh, of dimension, dimensionality n, where n is our search space. Um, and we're going to initialize them with random, uh, uniformly distributed random components from zero, I should do it with this, um, zero to alpha, where alpha is just some parameter that we pick. Um, then we define our convergence behavior. Um, so this has two terms. Um, each bird is now going to be tracking over time what the best position it's ever, ever found was. As, as, it, as it moved through space, it will keep track of its best position. Then at each, each point, it's going to want, to some extent, to move towards that best position. It's also going to ask all of the birds in its vicinity what their best positions are, um, and then it will contribute some factor towards moving towards that position as well. Um, so we just have three, three parameters here that describe how much randomness we have, um, and then beta and gamma def define how much we care about what I, what I have found as opposed to my neighbors. Um, these are really hard to pick in practice, um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of current academic research behind picking hyperparameters for metaheuristic models like this. Um, but we're just going to brush over that and presume that we can find optimal ones. OK, the algorithm is really simple, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I'll step through it for you. Um, at each time step, each particle computes the value of the fitness function at its current position. Then it compares that value to, um, to its previous best. This should be xp, not p. Um, anyway, um, so it compares, it compares the value that it's evaluated to its current best, and if so, if it's greater, updates it. Um, then we define um, it changes its velocity in some way. Uh, here, this delta function is just saying um, we take the sum of all the behaviors that we had before. Um, exactly as we had in our model. Then the system as a whole says, asks each bird what its best is and takes the maximum of those. Um, I should probably say that this, uh, this best that we're defining here is more, uh, is a metric that is good as it increases. Um, so the highest best is the, the most fit bird, the minimum value of the function, however you want to define it. And then we ask, are, are we done? Um, is this best good enough? Um, and if so, we stop. Um, this can be something like uh, we're within 2% of some optimal value we're trying to achieve. Um, the value is now negative, something, whatever. Could be on some number of time steps that we've iterated over. Otherwise, we keep going. And we just repeat this process until we find something. We can consider that quite a lot of the work that's being done here is uh, being done at a local level. Um, the, the birds evaluating their own fitness functions and comparing that to their previous best, that's entirely local. And then it has to ask its vicinity. So there's, there's some component of, um, has to ask ever, uh, some small subset of the birds. Um, and then we have to do this, this global behavior uh, of calculating the maximum. But we can say that we don't actually have to do this in, in every time step. Um, we could calculate a number of iterations, and then, and then after five, say, take the maximum and consider. All this is doing is defining a stopping condition. Um, so we could say, let's have a number of threads, each running these processes, um, defining over a shared data structure that um, allows them to access birds in their vicinity. Um, and then we can just perform this over, over a single thread that's performing this process. Um, and then we'll have a concurrent algorithm that works very well using this technique. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but you can ch change things slightly to make it a good distributed algorithm. Um, this particular algorithm doesn't define, doesn't go well into a distributed case because you have too much message, message passing, um, but you can change things slightly so that that works. Okay, to do MATLAB, um, the practical demonstration. Um, MATLAB is awful, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, um, I have three, three functions I want, I want to show you. One is simply a parabola. Um, I'm running 200 iterations of this simulation and stopping regardless of wherever I find. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so 
Um, we have the, the color here represents fitness, where um, orange, is, orange is poor fitness and, and blue is great fitness. Um, and then uh, our, our particles have moved through, and you can see they've kind of clustered around the actual minima, and the red, sh the, the red shows the true minimum value. Uh, so I'll give you the secret here, which is this is actually a 3D plot. Um, and you can see that we, uh, the birds have indeed converged towards the bottom. This isn't particularly interesting because we'd expect any numerical optimization algorithm to work well on a parabola. Um, so let's take a, a slightly harder case. Um, this is a case with a local minima, which is very close in value to a global minima. Um, and you can see that we've achieved a few, a few, maybe four arguably clusters here um, corresponding to local minima. And one of the, um, the, the flock has kind of split into these four, four uh, separate modules. Um, and one of those separate clusters has found a true minima. Um, if we have a look at the function, um, we can see that that's exactly what's happened. Um, there, is a, there is a true minima in, in this little cluster, and one of the birds in that sub-flock has found it. Okay, now I'm gonna show you something that's close to a pathological case. Um, okay, so here we have a nearly flat plane um, with ever so slight perturbations in it. Um, I've, had to, I've had to bound it um, so that the search space has a sharp peaks on the side um, because otherwise the birds will just fly off into infinity very quickly. Um, they, need, they need something to keep them bound in the search space. Um, if we have a look at this function, you'll see that I was telling the truth. It is in fact very close to being a plane, um, but even then, there is, there is some clustering that describes the small perturbations in this space, and the birds have seemed, have seemed to detect that. They are still moving towards that clustered, uh, clustered point. The true minima is here. Um, so they have, they have, to an extent, missed it, um, but one of, the birds, one, of the, one of the birds in the vicinity has still managed to find that point. Um, so we've had a close to a pathological case, but because our birds are, are more scattered than they would be in our previous case, um, one of them has still managed to find a good point. Okay. Um, so, to summarize, um, we can describe some natural behaviors in, uh, in nature, some complex natural behaviors, in terms of emergent complexity. So we can apply our theory to uh, these systems. It's not the only theory that describes how these things work, but it's quite a good one in terms of, in terms of its accuracy. Um, we can then create accurate simulations of these behaviors using emergent complexity. And this can help us um, understand things from a biological perspective, um, but it can also help us solve uh, problems in computer science. Um, and these, these solutions to problems are called uh, meta-heuristics, uh, which are a subclass of uh, swarm intelligence, um, just a random way of determining a heuristic for solving a problem. Um, and lastly, our meta-heuristics, um, swarm intelligence algorithms, are inherently distributive and because they, ha they have this property in nature um, and they're resistant to pathological cases, as we've seen before. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs>